Simo Heha, the deadliest sniper in military history. Simo Heha may not be a familiar name in the United States or many other parts of the world, but in Finland, he is a well respected hero, and in the Soviet Union, he will forever be remembered as the infamous The White Death. Simo Heha is widely regarded as the most skilled and successful sniper there ever was, with over 500 kills to his name. According to an American study, an average of 7,000 rifle caliber shots were required to achieve one combat kill during the First World War. During the Vietnam War, this number had increased to more than 25,000. So, for Simo Hejas, more than 505 kills, more than 13,550 bullets would have been needed in Vietnam. He remains the deadliest sniper who ever lived. Who was Simo Heha? Simo Heha was born on December 17, 1905 to Juho and Katrina Heha in the hamlet of Kitsikin in Rajavri municipality. This area was in the old Finnish region of Karelia, which is now Russian territory. He was a farmer by profession and enjoyed several different hobbies, including snow skiing, hunting, and shooting. He emerged from a bustling family of eight siblings, claiming the seventh spot. When it's frosty outside, there aren't many options but to stay close and stay warm. His father, Yuho, and his mother, Katrina, lived their lives by the teachings of Lutheranism. They toiled on a farm, and the whole clan pitched in, tackling the daily chores. Simo, known as Simona to his folks and brothers and sisters, grew up wielding a passion for both hunting and skiing, essential skills in Finland's unforgiving terrain. When he wasn't hitting the slopes, he was busy on the farm. The young Simona's education unfolded at the nearby Mitala school. Fast forward to his military journey, which started when Simo turned 17. He opted for the local militia, a crew known as the White Guard, his hunting background was the perfect prep for mastering the art of marksmanship. To say Simo was a sharpshooter doesn't quite cut it. He skyrocketed in his field, accumulating a collection of trophies snatched from shooting competitions. Yet humility was his signature trait, with no appetite for the spotlight, often lingering at the back during group photos. At 19, he dove into his compulsory military service with the newly minted Finnish army. This stint stretched to 15 months, during which he joined a bicycle battalion. Sounds strange, right? Well, Italy and Japan also embraced bicycles to keep the troops nimble without the logistical nightmare of horses. Simo remained a stalwart on the shooting range with his biographer and superior, Major Sarah Linonen, attesting to his skills. He could pinpoint distances with razor precision, even up to 150 meters with a mere meter of error. Moreover, he knocked down a standard sized target 16 times in one minute, wielding a rifle sporting a five round magazine. Clearly, his agility and mastery of firearms perfectly matched his dead eye shooting. Spoiler alert, this talent would soon become the linchpin of his future exploits. It might surprise you, but Simo didn't receive formal sniper training until 1938, a whopping 13 years into his military journey. Odd, right? But consider this, not many armies worldwide prioritized sniper training post-World War I, at least not until the specter of World War II emerged. This meant that the knowledge and skills of snipers had to be painstakingly reconstructed from the ground up. Now let's pivot to the Winter War, the arena where our hero would shine. The historical backdrop. Finland was a perennial tug-of-war prize between Russia and Sweden, with Russia eventually clinching dominance. Following the Russian Revolution and a bitter civil war, Finland planted its flag of independence on December 6, 1917. By that time, Russia wasn't in any shape to mount a response, and by May of the next year, the USA had officially legitimized Finland's sovereignty. But history doesn't fade quietly. 
with Joseph Stalin at the helm of the newly communist USSR in 1939, territorial demands were hurled toward Finland under the flimsy guise of security and the need to protect Leningrad, a mere 20 miles from the fresh border. In the murky discussions of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, Russia and Germany secretly mulled over their shared desire to invade Finland and usher in a puppet communist regime. The Finns, however, delivered a resounding no. And so it unfolded. On November 30th, 1939, the Red Army charged into Finnish territory, triggering what we now know as the Winter War. Those Russians would soon realize they'd bitten off far more than they could chew. Heha joined the ranks of the 34th Infantry Regiment, 6th Company, led by Lieutenant Aruna Utalainen. Their battleground? The epic Battle of Kola, down south in Finland. These troops duked it out along the frigid banks of the Kola River, battling not just the enemy, but also a punishing landscape. Supplies? Scarce as hen's teeth. Here's a stark comparison to highlight the disparity. The Finnish artillery had to make do with a meager thousand rounds a day, while their Russian counterparts unleashed a jaw-dropping 40,000 rounds daily. That's like comparing a squirt gun to a fire hose. Now picture this. The Red Army boasted four divisions and a tank brigade. The Finns, they had a lone division in their corner. Yet this outnumbered Finnish force stonewalled the Red Army's overwhelming numbers. Up north, elements of the 75th Division were sent packing, but when Utalainen was asked if Kola would hold, his response was an emphatic, Kola will hold unless the orders are to run away. Talk about sheer determination etching itself into Finnish lore. Enter Simo Heha, the White Death. The man was a lone wolf, given the green light to do what he did best. While the rest of the troops played it safe, Simo ventured out, set up his hide, and waited for his prey to stumble into his crosshairs. He came locked and loaded with two distinctive weapons. For close quarters combat, he brandished the Suomi KP-31 submachine gun, a fine yet often overlooked piece of hardware. It spit out 9mm rounds at a mind-boggling 900 per minute. Despite its heft, it was remarkably manageable in full auto mode, making it quite the workhorse. Some might say it looked like a Russian submachine gun of that era, but they were a breed apart. For long-range engagements, Simo toted an M2830 rifle, a Finnish variant of the Russian Mosin Nagant model of 1891 bolt-action rifle. The Finns affectionately dubbed it the Spitz due to its front sight protectors and barrel, looking somewhat like the head of a spit dog. Sure, some folks have a laundry list of complaints about it. They've even called it the garbage rod. The bolt-action felt stiff and the magazine follower spring was a tad too complex. Then there's the gripe about manually removing the charger clips after they're empty, rather than the bolt tossing them aside after chambering around. But let's not nitpick. It was sturdy and reliable, a perfect fit for the rugged, unforgiving environment it was designed for. Here's the kicker. Unlike most snipers, Simo didn't slap a telescopic sight on his rifle. You might think that put him at a disadvantage, but there's a method to his madness. A scope and lens can glint in the sunlight, revealing a sniper's position. And it tends to fog up in extreme cold. By sticking to iron sights, Simo nixed these issues, with just the front post and U-notch rear sight to line up. Dressing the part was key. Simo donned an all-white hooded smock over layers of warm clothing and a white balaclava, merging seamlessly with the snow-laden landscape. Under the shroud of night, he'd creep into position in a snow foxhole. But the genius touch, he'd pack down the snow around his rifle's muzzle to avoid the telltale plume of snow kicked up by the blast gases. Clever, right? He'd then stack more snow around the hole, a master of blending in like a true winter wraith. To maintain his cover, Simo played the patience game, staying holed up in his hide while keeping a watchful eye on the enemy. 
This vigil could last from dawn till dusk, but in the wintry depths of Finland, the nights were mer mercifully brief. From these concealed positions, Simo worked his deadly magic, racking up confirmed kills at an astonishing pace. Army records reveal the jaw-dropping tally. By December 22nd, he had taken down 138 adversaries. By January 26th, another 61 bit the dust. Come February 17th, an additional 20 met their demise. And in the remaining days of the conflict, 30 more souls were added to his grim count. The grand total, a staggering 259 confirmed kills, averaging about five takedowns per day. A kill-death ratio that would make any gamer envious. Now, some sources claim Simo's count could have been even higher, potentially reaching 505. It's said that certain situations, like close-quarter firefights, weren't accounted for. The Russians, perplexed by these stealthy shots, became downright superstitious. They even gave Simo a nickname, Malish Smirti, or the Little Death, while the Finns called him Taika Ampuja, the Magic Shooter. But as luck would have it, Simo's winning streak couldn't last forever. On March 6, 1940, a bullet found its mark, striking the left side of his face. It left a gruesome, blood-soaked mess, claiming both his upper and lower jaw, along with most of his cheek. The shock of the hit rendered him unconscious, and there he lay in a potentially grave situation. His comrades, mistaking him for dead, placed him with a pile of fallen comrades, awaiting burial. But luck smiled on Simo again. His commanding officer sent one of his men to find him. As this soldier sifted through the mound of bodies, he noticed a twitch in Simo's leg. There was hope that he might still be clinging to life. Simo was evacuated to the nearest field hospital, where his torn face was cleaned and dressed. He remained in a coma for a week, prompting rumors of his death to swirl both in Finland and Russia. The Winter War had been an arduous contest. The Finns put up a spirited fight, but the overwhelming weight of the Red Army, complete with tanks and aircraft, finally wore them down. The Treaty of Moscow, signed on March 13, 1940, ceded territory in Karelia and the Gulf of Finland Islands, as well as the region of Sala in Lapland and the Rybachi Peninsula. The port town of Hanko was leased to the Russians. When peace was declared, Simo awoke from his coma, amused to find the newspaper article stating he'd met his end. Eager to correct the record, he asked for pen and paper. The conflict had lasted just shy of three and a half months, a reminder for the Soviets that defending one's home could be a dogged affair. The Finns and Russians would cross swords again from 1941 to 1944 in the Continuation War, with the Finns receiving assistance from Nazi Germany and the Soviets from Britain, a proxy war within spitting distance of a much larger conflict. Simo offered to serve in this war, but was excused due to his facial injury, which was still on the mend. The war ended with more land ceded to the USSR and the leasing of Porkala Peninsula for 12 years. Post-war and into his twilight years, despite the Finnish defeat, Simo's incredible kill record solidified his place in history as the deadliest sniper ever. All of this achieved with an old rifle and a set of iron sights. The White Death's legacy lives on. Field Marshal Carl Gustav Mannheim recognized Simo's valor by promoting him to a junior officer. His dedication and service to the nation earned him a slew of decorations, including the first and second class Liberty Medals. The third and fourth class Cross of Liberty, typically reserved for officers, and the Kola Fighters Medal. There was even a nomination for Finland's highest honor, the Knight of the Mannheim Cross, although it appears to have gone ungranted. As a special tribute, he was gifted an honorary rifle, complete with an engraved nameplate akin to the one he wielded during battle. Today, this rifle stands on display at the Finnish Military Museum in Helsinki. However, it wasn't an easy road to recovery for Heha. It took several years to heal from his wartime injuries, requiring extensive treatments and multiple surgeries. 
While his face remained disfigured, he managed a full recovery. After World War II, he received a farm in Valkjarvi, a small municipality nestled in southeastern Finland near the Russian border. Here, Simo reinvented himself as a successful moose hunter and dog breeder. He reveled in farming and found solace in hunting, even hosting hunting parties with the likes of Finland's president, Urho Kekkonen. Yet not everyone celebrated Simo's wartime deeds. His actions during the Winter War stirred up hatred and even death threats. The scars on his face were constant reminders of the battlefield, so, as a well-known figure, he avoided large gatherings. Simo never married, living out his days as a bachelor. Loneliness and fear often clouded his nights, and farm work eventually grew too demanding. He decided to rent out the farm and relocated to an apartment building in the heart of Rio Kaladi. Simo Heha was a man of exceptional modesty. He seldom spoke about the war or his experiences. When asked in 1998 about the secret behind his remarkable sniping skills, his answer was simple, practice. In a candid interview with Helsingin Sanomat shortly before his 96th birthday in December 2001, Heha provided insights into his wartime memories. When questioned about any remorse for taking so many lives, he responded, I did what I was told to do, as well as I could. There would be no Finland unless everyone else had done the same. In his final years, Simo resided in a nursing home for war veterans in Hamina, where he passed away in 2002 at the age of 96. He found his resting place in his hometown of Rio Kaladi, leaving behind a legacy that would forever be etched in history. Simo Heha stands as the ultimate sniper in history because he possessed a deep understanding of his surroundings. He was not merely a marksman, but a skilled trekker and hunter, a man who could meld seamlessly with the terrain, always eluding the watchful eyes of the enemy. His weapon was an extension of himself, a faithful companion he had wielded for years, and he knew its every nuance in the challenging conditions of the battlefield. What set him apart beyond his technical prowess was his temperament, a true sniper's disposition. Simo was not just comfortable with solitude, he thrived in it. He had the rare ability to compartmentalize the emotions that most would inevitably link to a job that involved taking lives from afar. His stature, often underestimated, belied his innate talent as a hunter, making him a natural fit for the world of sniping. In my numerous conversations with him during the twilight of his life, one invaluable insight consistently resurfaced. Simo never sugarcoated the truth about war. He'd emphasize, war is not a pleasant experience. Yet he recognized the critical question it posed. Who else would protect this land unless we are willing to do it ourselves? His unwavering commitment to safeguarding his homeland remains an enduring testament to his character and the sacrifices made during times of conflict. Goodbye, the deadliest sniper in military history.